welcome to this video podcast, which is the latest in a series of podcasts about the new Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists Online. The Encyclopedia, or ESDA, was launched on the 1st of July. It is the Adventist Church's first online reference work. It features thousands of articles from around the world on a wide variety of topics, including articles on Adventist missionaries, institutions, organizations, and beliefs, and we'll be talking about that today. But if you haven't checked the ESDA website yet, please do so. It's at encyclopedia.adventist.org. That's encyclopedia.adventist.org. I am your host, David Trim. I'm director of the Office of Archives, Statistics, and Research at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, and I am the editor of the ESDA. And with me is Dr. Dragoslava Suntrak, the managing editor of the encyclopedia, who's my co-host. And our guests today are Dr. Frank Hazel and Dr. Dennis Kaiser. Dr. Hazel is associate director of the Biblical Research Institute at the General Conference. And Dr. Kaiser is assistant professor of church history at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary, Andrews University. Dr. Hazel and Dr. Kaiser are the editors for the History of Theology and Ethics block of articles in the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists. Frank, Dennis, thank you very much for agreeing to be with us today. My pleasure. Good to be with you. It's nice to be here. Could you tell us about your role in the Encyclopedia Project as editors of the History of Theology and Ethics block of articles? Well, when I joined the, the uh, Biblical Research Institute in 2016 at the General Conference, I was invited to participate in the History of Theology and Ethics subcommittee, and I did that. And then a year later, I was asked whether um, I would be willing to um, lead out in, in that um, subcommittee. Uh, and to to be the assistant editor there and uh, carry the responsibility for that. And uh, that is kind of how I, um, how I got connected to the ESDA and to that particular field. And uh, then uh, Dennis was invited to, to join and uh, to give um, uh, additional help in, in, um, in the editing process and in organizing everything, and so he is, he is a very valuable uh, asset to, to the team. So I think, uh, especially because um, in teaching the development of Adventist theology at the seminary, and also Ellen White studies um, at the seminary, um, therefore, some people thought that I would be a good um, help and assistant when it comes to this project. Uh, because we're dealing specifically with uh, these ten, kinds of topics that I'm teaching about. And so I'm glad that I can um, serve as a sub-editor uh, for the section. And when you say some people thought, what you particularly mean is that Frank thought uh, that you would be a good addition. And of course, we agreed uh, without any hesitation. <laughs> that may be the background information that I wasn't fully aware of. Huh? But it's good to learn about it. <laughs> As uh, Dr. Hazel and Dr. Kaiser, we are immensely blessed to have you uh, as editors on the ESDA team, and uh, we want to publicly thank you for your role and for your work that, you, that you've been doing and helping us launch the encyclopedia and continue the work. Uh, you are the editors of a very important section of the encyclopedia. It is the history of theology and ethics. Now, uh, I'm thinking our viewers perhaps wonder what the history of theology and ethics include. Could you uh, explain a little bit more about this particular uh, uh, group of articles? What are they about? Sure, it's a, it's a, it's a wide variety of different subjects and topics, and uh, Dennis can fill in some of the information that I might miss uh, to point out. But... Um, it deals with a number of important uh, subjects that are close to our Adventist uh, understanding. So it has uh, theological questions and subjects. Uh, uh, it has ethical questions, bioethics, abortion, uh, different ethical uh, 
subjects that um, we need to learn how the church has uh, seen things and uh, how over the years we have um, uh, we have dealt with different subjects. And the same is true for the uh, biblical and theological subjects. Uh, that, that could range from um, the nature of Christ to the Trinity to um, uh, the number of the beast to mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of, of yes. different uh, subjects mm -hmm. that we deal with and that we have uh, had questions about and uh, where we uh, have responded to to various positions and so that is part of the uh, the, the large group of uh, subjects that we deal with in that particular section. So now we may say that uh, some topics kind of like are more of a theological nature, um, for example, like certain doctrines that we hold as a church. Mm -hmm. Some other topics um, are not so much theological topics, but more topics uh, that have to do with the interpretation of a certain passage. And uh, that have been points of controversy in the church where um, there were different positions and maybe still are different positions in the church. And so the, uh, the purpose here is not necessarily to define like what should be believed, what is the, the, the uh, correct doctrine on this, but to kind of show, okay, there were different views here uh, and uh, this is how it developed in the church. Mm -hmm. um, and so while some uh, subjects will focus primarily on the development of mm -hmm. different understandings uh, in the Adventist church mm -hmm. and the history of the Adventist church, some topics, uh, like other topics, they will actually go back uh, more into history and point out how a certain passage or doctrine has been understood also in the history, because that serves as a background to um, some of the views that exist in our church today. And if I may just add um, a, a little uh, additional information here, I'm also the editor of the uh, Biblical and Theological Dictionary of the SDA Bible Dictionary. And here we deal with a biblical, with a biblical foundation of particular subjects, whereas in the ESDA, we look more at the historical development of some of our understanding. And that is very fascinating and, and also so important. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for making this distinction. And I think yes. that's uh, very important to highlight that. Um, can we say that perhaps the history of theology and ethics reflect what some call progressive revelation or the church's growing understanding of biblical and theological truths? Well, that's... that's a, <laughs> go ahead, Dennis. No, I think it's both in that sense because... Um, as we look deeper into the history of the Athens church, we will see that uh, people want to understand what the Bible says in certain topics. Mm -hmm. And so the way how uh, truth is revealed progressively in the Bible itself, mm -hmm. yes. um, we may say that uh, the same is also true for our understanding, mm -hmm. that um, Adventists wanted to understand more, wanted to understand things better. And so there we often find a growth in understanding of certain topics. Now, that growth is not always kind of like gradually just going upward. Yeah? Yes. Um, there are discussions happening. Yeah? Um, but in general, I think we see that there is um, the examples of progressive revelation. I think also specifically uh, is that something that we see in the, uh, in the life and, and ministry of Ellen White, who um, commented on different topics uh, as well, as well as that different people in the Adventist Church try to understand scripture better. And um, they strove to understand uh, the Bible, and they they struggled. Yeah, they um, discussed things, and um, to see that is, I think, fascinating, um, and is I think also an example for us today. Um, yes, there may be some struggles that we have in the church today. Ultimately, it's important that uh, we discuss topics and study topics in the right spirit. Yes. And so here yes. we have good. And bad examples also the history of our church for that. But I think you know, there's a distinction, isn't there, between the idea of progressive revelation and a growing understanding. Exactly. Uh, the growing understanding may be because we're too busy debating certain things or we're too set in our preconception. There could be all kinds of revel re reasons. Whereas progressive revelation, I think, implies that God perhaps 
releases more to his church and especially through uh, his prophet, but to his church uh, as its own, as it becomes matures and, and so forth. But, and, and those there's obviously could be an overlap between those. Um, I draw that distinction partly because, you know, progressive revelation could be its own article uh, in your block of articles and does attract some controversy in some circles because of the idea that, uh, you know, some would like to think, well, God's going to show us that these various things that we now find embarrassing were never meant to apply to us in the first place. Um, and I don't think that's what any of us on this uh, video podcast would believe. No. Uh, and there's a difference between that, though, and saying, well, the church took a while to grasp what the Bible was really saying. Yes. Yeah. Well, we perhaps we would not claim to uh, to have revelation because that's a divine attribute, really, <laughs> that we do not claim yeah. to have, at least not at the team here. And uh, <laughs> but, um, you but we that. certainly <laughs> look into developments of ideas and uh, developments of thoughts, and there is much to to learn in in our understanding of a certain biblical truth. And uh, I think that makes it so fascinating and. It's not just uh, the, it's not just the progressive revelation or however you want to call that. Mm -hmm. There is also the idea, and I think that is just equally uh, important and significant uh, to our understanding of things, uh, where we where we have to see the continuity of mm -hmm. thought uh, mm -hmm. in in our theology and in our understanding of things, where we connect to our. Um, pioneers where we connect yes. to those who have started the uh, the church and our movement and I, I think to see that where we have continuities as well as new light Even. where we grow in our understanding and we uh we gain a deeper and better understanding i think that is that is the beauty yes. of it mm -hmm. and sure. i think you make an interesting point there uh, th there is the continuity, and at times that's important, but also it's possible, I think, not to have a significant shift in the theology as such, but to understand its application in different ways. Mm -hmm. and, and one thinks of views of mission, for example, uh, that as the church, when the church is limited to North America, it's going to have a different application of some of the doctrines about mission than it will as it you know gradually expands around the world um yes and the but equally then you get the whole issue of contextualization and uh uh and that has its own uh challenges uh and its own vexed uh history which i think is probably highlighting for us just even the conversation we've had so far that this is an interesting block of articles to be responsible for Mm -hmm. um, yes. Do you see it as more of a, how can I say this, more of a, of a challenge or an opportunity? <laughs> I think it's in both, yeah, because um, it's an opportunity to uh, better understand um, how a certain, let's say, views that we have as a church today or that exist in the church today among Adventists, how they developed. Yeah? So I think that is a, a, a wonderful opportunity to uh, just understand, yeah? um, also understand why, um, let's say, and how um, early Adventists uh, arrived at certain views. Uh, of course, it's a challenge to find people that are qualified to write about those because it's not just important to be a specialist on a certain topic, biblically speaking, like as an exegete, um, but also to have somebody who is um, maybe at the same time also a historian and who is able to um, access uh, the sources and uh, then write in a historic way. I think so. It's both it's challenging, but it's also um, it's also fun. I, I personally see it more as an opportunity, but there are certainly some challenges that we have to work with. But uh, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity really to have that because I think it helps us to better understand where we come from, to better understand why we believe what we believe. And, uh, and, uh, and we have to remember uh, theology uh, never happens in a vacuum. You know, it, it, it is connected with uh, people. It is yes. connected hmm. with events in history. It yes. is connected on, on local and global issues. 
And uh, to know that gives uh, a unique background information, I think, that can help us to better situate some of the yeah. discussions we might have had mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. still have yeah. and uh, to see the dynamics in there and, and also to see that uh, many of the theological questions uh, were not just uh, theological questions, but you mm -hmm. also had uh, personality type of uh, challenges that yes. went along with that. How people presented themselves or the truth, uh, yeah, for that matter, and and uh, that also poses a, a, a challenge. And and I think to be fair to the evidence and to be fair to to that com fairly complete picture, that that is the challenge that I see uh, to uh, to present in that particular section. So give us some examples. Give us a couple of examples of articles that are in the history of theology and ethics blocks that kind of illustrate the, the points you've been making. In um, one chapter, I mean, there are several topics that we could list. We have, I think, like 190 topics. Uh, but just to give a couple of examples, um, the topic for the Trinity, I think it's a very interesting one. Yes. Um, and of course, there are some discussions of the church on that topic. So when once that topic was online, people should read that. Huh? Um, inspiration, um, like different views of uh, like how the Holy Spirit operated in like in the process of divine inspiration. That's another topic. Or the number of the beast, you know, like Revelation chapter thirteen, um, like how like people interpreted that passage in the Adventist Church. Um, I think we have another topic that's like the twenty five twenty. That among some circles of some circles of Adventists today is a topic. Um, the creeds, um, Adventist views on creeds, um, attitudes towards creeds. So there are, I think, a number of interesting topics. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, now, now that you mentioned all these wonderful topics, I keep wondering uh, what are the sources of information for these articles? How someone goes about writing an article on the history of a certain theological topic. Obviously, it's not just biblical exegesis. So how, how do your authors go about researching and writing these articles? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. And uh, mm -hmm. we have guidelines that we mm -hmm. give to every author that will help him or her to write uh, an article. And uh, in that section, of course, it's not so much the biblical um, mm -hmm. exegesis of things, but it is yes. the historical mm -hmm. development of ideas. Mm -hmm. So you would, you would approach the, the subject from a historical perspective primarily and uh, look at uh, primary sources. So you mm -hmm. would go to uh, published articles, you would go mm -hmm. to books, you would go to uh, perhaps even personal interviews uh, on, on some subjects. And uh, you would um, try to compile that information mm -hmm. and uh, order it historically, mm -hmm. systematically, uh, so that uh, you can see how we have responded, how we mm -hmm. have um, developed some ideas in our church and uh, how that has progressed over the years. And I think that would be, um, in a nutshell, uh, how I would say um, articles in that section should be approached. I think a wonderful thing is that many of the um, periodicals of the Adventist Church, at least the English-speaking ones, um, as well as books and so on, have been digitized and are available on the website of the John Conference Archives, as well as the Adventist Digital Library. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to correspondence, for example, Ellen White's correspondence, like letters and manuscripts, diaries, um, letters that people sent to Ellen White. And so there we have lots of people like church leaders who send letters to Ellen White. They are available on the website of the Ellen White estate. They also have been scanned or um, digitized. So in that sense, um, for our authors, it's not just necessary to, let's say, go to, a, um, to the Ellen White estate or to mm -hmm. the different places that have uh, historical materials, but actually many things can be accessed from the... Um, from the nice, uh, from our homes, basically. Yes, yes. Now, yes. when it comes to the writing of things, I think mm -hmm. uh, Frank already mentioned a couple important points. But mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I always like to point out is that um, 
people can take kind of two different approaches to, to things, at least. One is maybe an inductive approach, another one a deductive approach. If I already know what I want to, um, what the outcome will be. If I want to prove something, if I want to prove somebody else wrong, mm -hmm. I think that's not the right approach because mm -hmm. then I'm just looking for supporting evidence and supporting materials. However, if I say I study and research because I want to understand, mm, I look yes. at all kinds of materials that I can mm -hmm. find on the topic, and then I look for the patterns that are there. Then I see, oh, there were different groups, mm -hmm. different positions, and so on, and then see how that develops. Then my attitude is truly one of trying to understand people for their own sake. So, so and I think that is more the approach that we expect from our authors. Um, and I think that's more truthful. And then we are also more yes. open to all kinds of evidence and not just the one that yes. supports my view or um, to prove somebody else wrong. Yes, <laughs> yes. That yeah. is, that's also the historian's approach to, to understand why people, why our, uh, some of our pioneers got the doctrine of the Trinity really very wrong mm -hmm. uh, and why it changed. And, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not, you've, made, you've both made a couple of times the very good point that this, these articles aren't a biblical study. And neither are they, at least not directly, apologetics. Mm -hmm. But we hope that many people reading them would find Adventists attractive as a result. It is to say, you know, what happened and why did people think this? Why did they, they, why did they argue? Why did they change their minds? And because that means we're not studying um, divine truth in a sense. We're studying people and thus I think it makes it easier to say, yes, there were some mistakes made because God does not mistake, make mistakes in the uh, revelation he imparts. But people, because they are human, make mistakes in how they understand it. Mm -hmm. and so I think uh, that historical approach then actually uh, gives, I think, a richer understanding. But at the same time, our hope is that it will complement the, uh, the biblical and theological okay. dictionary. That those two reference works uh, will, will, will each complement the other. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you so much for describing the, the, the whole process. It's uh, certainly reassuring to know that uh, our authors possess this thirst for uh, knowledge and also, I would say, um, curiosity to ask the right questions mm -hmm. and also a certain degree of creativity to, to select information and to put things together. It, it really sounds like a very exciting uh, process. Uh, could you tell us what you have learned from the history of Adventist theology? Uh, what do you hope that the encyclopedia readers will learn from your articles? You know, actually, I have learned quite a bit to, begin, to be frank and honest with you. And... Uh, uh, I'm a systematic theologian, so history is part of the interest of my uh, area of specialty, and I think it is an important part. And uh, just reading and editing some of the articles that we have recently received and uh, where we have uh, received feedback from other people, because it's a peer-reviewed process, really. Mm -hmm. And that is important to know also. It's not just uh, that we select an author or invite an author to write, but uh, there are at least two independent uh, peer reviewers who read the article and give feedback, uh, who are experts in the field, and this will, uh, will be um, taken into consideration. And, and so um, it's not just the opinion of one person basically okay. writing the article. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, the editorial process, and it goes through that. And, and in the end, we'll have an article that hopefully is, uh, is, is fair in its uh, description of things and in the presentation of facts. So what I have learned really is that history is, uh, is a very dynamic process. Mm. And, you know, sometimes people think history is boring. Uh, mm -hmm. But no, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a dynamic process and it's, it's quite complex. And if we do not... Um, value and, and cherish the complexity of history. You know, we might be tempted to give very simplistic answers to yeah. some things that are rather yeah. complex. 
And if we don't understand the complexity of things, I think we might, uh, we might end up um, giving a wrong uh, interpretation of some things uh, that really need to be taken in their complexity mm -hmm. and uh, with the different factors and so yeah. forth. So this is something that I have learned, you know, uh, and sometimes people uh, tend to give shortcut answers because it's easy and it's uh, it's convenient, you know, and and it's very easy to say, oh, um, let's say on the number of the beast, you know, uh, uh, oh yeah, the, the pioneers have used 666 and the Tayera, you know, and then the, the Pope and everything. And actually there is no evidence for that. And so they were completely wrong. You know, that's one, one way to approach it, you know, but uh, if you dig deeper into that, you find, oh, there might be some reasons that uh, some of mm -hmm. the critics have, have not even taken into consideration or some of the other things that uh, maybe have not been so helpful in the first place. Mm -hmm. and, and to see that, uh, that dynamic and to see how not just within the Adventist church, but also in the larger Christian church mm -hmm. history, things have been uh, dealt with. Yeah. It gives, gives you a perspective of where we come from and uh, where, uh, where we share uh, things with other Christians. It's not just that, that we, we have come up with all the truth ourselves, you know. We stand on the shoulders of many uh, giants uh, that we appreciate uh, in church history. And so we need to know what, uh, what their contributions were. And so uh, I'm grateful for that, and I have learned a lot, uh, even in the in the few things that uh, I've been working with. You have yeah. both made the history of Adventist theology appear exciting and engaging. Uh, talking with you, I think people would say, "Wow, this this sounds really interesting." <laughs> um, I think probably some of our readers, though, or potential readers, might say, "Well, I can see that a biography." would be interesting because it's a story. Yes. Um, can the history of Adventist theology be exciting? Is there something there that will be of interest to the average church member? Is there something there that would draw young people, for example? I think that Adventist history can be extremely exciting. Um, because as we- Show your excitement. <laughs> I'm German, so it's like, <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah. Um, and I think it can be very exciting because um, I think especially young people, they look for, they look for authenticity. Mm. And, um, but how do people become um, authentic? I think it's especially when they become, um, when they make themselves vulnerable and admit that they have made mistakes, admit that, uh, that they have struggled with things, that they have weaknesses and so on. And I think uh, I had students who told me that reading Ellen White's letters and manuscripts, for example, in her diaries was extremely attractive to them because uh, mm -hmm. that made her actually authentic to them. And in that sense, she became an authority, which is very interesting. Yeah? And I think uh, as we look into the way how people have uh, struggled with, um, let's say, the understand like struggled with understanding scripture, understanding different passages in the Bible, um, and so it becomes real. We see actual real people. Uh, we see people that are, yes, they lived like uh, 150 years before us or 100 years before us. In that sense, they, uh, they may be different. But on the other hand, there are, I think, common human issues, common human weaknesses, common human desires that we see there. And um, that make these people real, that make these people, in a way, vulnerable and authentic but also turn them into examples so that we can say, actually, um, I want to be like this guy. Mm. Or I want, to, uh, I want to, yes, dig deeper into scripture, find new things. And, um, and in that sense, I think that that's uh, something extremely exciting. Another important aspect, I think, is um, as we look into some of the topics, as people read about the topics, they realize that it's not just, um, let's say, all right or all wrong, um, picking up kind of the, uh, the terms again, like continuity and maybe change. Yeah? For yes. example, when we look at the topic of the Trinity, we see that the early Adventist pioneers, they rejected the doctrine of the Trinity for various reasons. Yeah? 
And as we look at their growth in understanding scripture on the subject, we see that there is some change, but we see there's also continuity. Mm. The early Adventists were really concerned with the relational, uh, with the relationship between the father and the son, a distinct mm. yeah. relationship. And so that's why they were against, um, for example, modalist views of God or tritheist views of God. But we mm. still are against these views today. So there is continuity, actually. Huh? And I think there's actually, um, there's continuity and change in that sense. And to have a nuanced perspective of that is more complex, is more realistic. And it's actually the way how we experience life. Because and if, if I could just add a, a little something to what Dennis has said, I'm fully with, with what he said. You know, theology is not done by robots, not yet. Uh, it is done by real people. Mm -hmm. And uh, we should never forget that because whatever theological subject you discuss, it is presented by people who have studied that subject. And that really makes theology and any theological subject so interesting because you're dealing with uh, real people. And, and uh, the thing that fascinates me, and I think that can inspire many young people and, and older people and more, more experienced people for that matter, is to see the dedication and even the sacrifice with which people were willing to stand for the truth or to present certain biblicals insights that they have gained through their studies and to see that spirit of dedication and that spirit of sacrifice i think if the encyclopedia can can just um hint a little bit at that mm -hmm. and inspire a little something of that same dedication that same sacrifice that same devotion to the word of god i think um it will do a wonderful job and uh it can inspire many people and and i think that is uh, that is something that that I um, really appreciate about the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Encyclopedia. And, and I think it shows, and I'm speaking as a theologian and historian for that matter, um, God's guiding hand, even yes. in our history. And it's undeniable to me that there is God's guiding hand through all the ups and downs that we see and that we sometimes uh, struggle with. Yes. But yet, it's still his church, and it's amazing to see that, and and that gives me hope. Yes, yes. thank so, you so much uh, I, for for highlighting these two very important yes. things that we see a real people, but on the other hand, we also see a real loving God who leads his people through their various struggles and good sides and to their doubts and questions. And it is God's truth and his grace that triumph all the time. In, and we can see that in, in our history so clearly. And so it, thank you very much for saying that. Yeah. Indeed. And also, it sounds like what you're really saying is that in articles on theology, as well as biographies, we find people. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps even more so because they're the history as opposed to a study of revealed truth. Uh, they are the study of how people grappled with the way God has revealed truth and had to came to understand it. So for those uh, potential readers who think I only want to read about people, people made the doctrines of the Seventh-day right. Adventist Church. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and we have two very good people, two very good colleagues uh, who are bringing that out. Uh, Frank and Dennis, thank you very much for being our guest today and for talking so frankly about this really important work that you're doing. My pleasure. Thank you much more, my pleasure. Again, we've had as our guest today Dr. Frank Hazel and Dr. Dennis Kaiser, the ESDA editors for the History of Theology and Ethics. We'll see you soon with more ESDA editors and more stories from the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists online. Please read more at encyclopedia.adventist.org. Thank you so much for being with us. God bless. <laughs>